It's showtime. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, I must say, like, somebody once told me that there's no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> I am looking at a full classroom, so I guess they were wrong. I know, I know. The people that don't come here a lot are watching the movies. Yeah, I heard that one before, too. Okay, today's going to be a fun day for me and a fun day for all of us. And today, we are going to completely lose our fear forever for exams. And uh, I don't know, I did write down a couple of announcements to make for everybody. Well, for the people uh, offline, in other words, the real warm bodies here in class, you know, people that pay me, uh, this is going to be our last class for the semester. I know you got a bunch of tests coming up, and I'll be going back. And I might come back also if they, uh, you know, ask me to, you know, and they have not been told about all these evil things that I'm doing. So I might be back uh, to teach maybe the new group or whatever I could be useful as uh, next year. Now, I was told that the next official class is January 9th. But that announcement is not for you. That announcement is for the people online. People online, this is the last class before Christmas vacation, okay? I know it's not politically correct to say Christmas vacation. We have to say holiday season or something like that. But we always call it Christmas vacation. Uh, and then, uh, so there will be no more classes from me as webinars or as in real class until January 9th. Okay, we're done with that. And here's my little announcement. Now that's my last day, I guess I could let loose a little bit. I, I, my coffee is a half strength today, by the way, because I don't have to think today. All I gotta do is show stuff. You're the people that are gonna have to think. So it's gonna be an easy, fun day for me. And I probably skirted around this a lot before, but uh, and I have, in all the years I've been teaching, I have not been busted yet. Uh, and probably the reason why I haven't been busted is because this is the way I was taught pathology by the most enlightened pathology professor in the entire world, whose name is Martin Swerdlow, who I went to visit not too many weeks ago. And what he would do is he would have a nice so-called review session before the path exams, and he would zoom in, you know, let's say if there were a uh, if everybody knew the test was going to be 50 questions, he shows you 50 slides. And of course, that's how he got from 20% attendance to 100% attendance on the review day. Now, in those days, uh, we didn't have something called an M drive or PowerPoint, but uh, these review sessions were strictly. Uh, you know, what says, what, what do they say? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas are strictly for the people here. I will probably not put them on the M drive, but the slides, the chapters that these are extracted from with the yellow guys, which have been there now for three or four days, those are on the M drive. We're gonna give you a kind of a, a, a better slant on things. Uh, who, is a, who is a fast runner? Who knows how to run real fast? Did I hear somebody? Could you please run, could you please run up to uh, room 222 on top and get my uh, iPad out of my office? Because it's a thing that I forgot. Thank you. On your mark. Is it open? Yeah, it's, a, it's open. Yeah, it, it's right, uh, 222. You'll see it laying around. Uh, She's not going to miss anything. And I've said this before, and uh, I'll say it again. I have, an, I have a really, really, really tremendous amount of, I think the best word is sympathy, OK? I really can't think of a better word. I mean, I like it. Uh, but mostly, it's pity, OK? Because I know what you're going through. You know, I know you're going into hock. You know, you sold your car, your roller skates. You now have bought a house because you're a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt. I mean, I know the statistics. And your whole life, you have wanted to experience the joy of being what you've always wanted to be. Physicians, 
American physicians, American licensed physicians, for the most part. And then you come to medical school and you're tortured. You're turned into exam junkies. And probably, I don't know, maybe two or three students I see in the hallway or upstairs or whatever, in, during, or after class, and, and they say, what's going to be on the test? Tell me. And that's basically, I know, what determines your attendance, which is why you're all here today. Uh, you're all going to get A's on my exam. Are there one of you? That's, that's not an iPod. I didn't see anything else on your desk. There's an iPad. There's a, there, Where? OK, just run up again. It's an iPad. It's not an iPod. It's an iPad. Right. And it's probably on my shelf, on you know, my shelf. bookshelf. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. But we're going to time you again. That last one was 32 seconds. Uh, so I have contempt for a lot of things because I practiced medicine my whole life. And when I get going on rants about, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, sometimes I go ballistic and I can't even control myself. And the hell that you're living in right now will be over when you finish your last board exam. And then the state will say, Okay, well, you no longer have to prove that you're smart and you want to be a doctor, but now you're going to have to prove that you had your butt on a chair for an hour and you're going to have to give us these CME credits in order for you to keep your license. And that's pretty despicable. But the fear that you're going to transform into, I shouldn't be talking about fear before the exam. It's going to be much greater than what you're experiencing now. And that's why I'm going to go on my little rant for a couple of minutes. Thank you very, very, very much. You get an A. And uh, it's going to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, if you were here when I gave my first pathology lecture, which I do when I start, if I didn't start with you, I have a really nice picture. I could show it now, but it's a picture of a whole bunch of maggots. And then something which looks like a hyena, but I guess it could be a jackal. And then on the right side, there's like the world's biggest cockroach. And so I call those the three uh, horrible things you're going to deal with. The maggots are the malpractice attorneys. I don't have to go any further on that. They're very sleazy. They take variations of opinions. Like if I went up to you and I said, hey, you know, I've got a pain here. What is it? Well, you'll give me your opinion. You'll give me your opinion. You'll give me your opinion. And guess what? They'll be good opinions. They'll be based on anatomy, physiology, but there's going to be a lot of variation. One of them is going to say, oh, take two aspirin, call me in the morning. The other guy's going to say, you've got three months to live. Okay? So there's a little bit of variation in opinion. Well, what the malpractice attorneys do is they take those variations and they find other people that disagree with you, especially if they are sitting on a bench in a place called Harvard. And then they make you look totally stupid. And guess what? Some people kill themselves because of that. And it has nothing to do with the truth. It has nothing to do with competence. This is how those maggots speak. And then the second group, remember I said four horsemen, but we're going to really talk about three for now. Somebody called corporate administrators. You know, I know you're supposed to, you know, be friends with your administrator and take them golfing and stuff, but remember, his only job is to see how much money he can rape out of you. Because corporations, what they do, theoretically, all they do is own the box that we practice medicine in. You know, UMHS owns this box that I practice teaching in. But I could just, we could just as easily do it down at the beach without a box. Well, those are the old days. You'd go up to an administrator and say, hey, you know, make the box better, or I'm going to another hospital. Now they have learned how the people that own the box capture you. And they got tons and tons and tons of money. And they know how to conquer you. And they know how to conquer you because they know your whole life you have been set against each other already. I was 
I'm almost tempted to use the F word, but I'll really restrain myself. By these things called exams, that half of you know you're going to flunk out, you have no reason to cooperate with him. You have no reason to work with him. You have every reason to sabotage it. And that's the way it's always been. And you know what? I'm going to do what I can to end it because everybody's going to do well on my exam. Everybody, I guarantee you. I guess like if you have a seizure or something, or you've got such <laughs> extreme anxiety, or maybe you had uh, you know too much of what Dr. Rogers was talking about on the previous class, alcohol. I guess you could like totally screw it up. Um, the third thing, which was the cockroach, and believe it or not, that is the government. Those are the federal regulators. Those are the people that regulate your license. Every doctor I know has been harassed by these people and threatened and bullied. And that's when the government was just half of medicine. Now, in the United States, maybe it's going to be all of medicine. It's not going to be better. Uh, we were able to stand up against a $40 billion corporation, hand in hand, solidarity, even if we had differences, even if you were both urologists and you were competing for patients. Uh, we're able to stand up hand in hand and beat them all the way to the Supreme Court because of solidarity. So I'm not going to tell you all my theories as to how to deal with these three beasts. But I will tell you the main thing is to stick together. Now you're probably saying, well, you told us about three slimy things. What about the fourth horseman? You want to call him pestilence? You want to call him death? You want to call him plague? What do you want to call them? You want to call them a uh, war or conquest? They go by different names depending on what version of the Bible you read. You want to know who the worst one is? It wouldn't be fair to talk about ethical topics unless we focus on the most and the only ethical person you can control, and that's you. Our worst enemy is ourselves. And let me tell you something. You're sitting here worried about the exam, and I'm telling you you don't have to worry, but then you're worried about the big exams, which I will tell you, you do have to worry. But uh, you're a little bit worried about that stuff, but what you don't realize is that these guys are going to be much, much, much bigger worries. And every single person here, every single doctor I know, every single doctor I've practiced with for 30 years, when you say what's probably the most horrible thing that happened to you, they'll tell you the same story. It's not going to be from the government. It's not going to be from the administrator. It's not going to be from the health practice attorney. It's going to be from their own peers. And it's what you call, oh, now I'm really tempted to use the F word. Mm -hmm. It's what you call fucking your brother, okay? Every one of you, when you go to practice, is going to go to a group, if there is such a thing as group, or maybe go into private practice, if there is such a thing as private practice. And they're going to say, you know, we're all making 400000 a year, and you're well-trained. We like you. We want you. You know, and oh my God. And, uh, oh, you know all that stuff. So, guess what? We'll give you a couple hundred thousand a year. And guess what? In a couple years, we'll make you a partner. It's always a lie. Always a lot. There's no exceptions to it. And first, when you start out, and for every two, four hundred thousand dollars worth of services you're making, you're giving them half. Okay? You're not cutting the pie yet. But they're going to tell you, oh, you're walking on water. This is lovely. You're so smart. And then that period of time is going to come in a couple years. And they're going to say, you know, you came in late today. Or, look, we got a letter against the patient. For you. And then when it comes close and close and close to time for them to cut the cake, they're going to fire you. It happened to every single person I know. It happened to me twice. I did it to somebody else once. And it's the worst thing that could happen. Just remember this, because I don't want you to fear the little things at the exam. I want you to fear the big things. And I have a radiologist friend that was a totally screwed by a group. He summarized my whole talk up in about six or seven words. He says, you never know what a man is like until you quit putting money in his pocket. And that's not really part of our Hippocratic ideas. It's not part of our Hippocratic oath. Well, the good news is, folks, 
Uh, I had planned on doing a lab today in hematology, but you know, when I go home, I do something other than play Scrabble. I also think, and I'm thinking, you know, it's really not fair that we continue this uh, hematology thing just to show them a few red cells, which they all have the link to anyway, because the big thing here, and the reason you're all here is because you want to do well on the exam. So uh, we're not going to do at all today the uh, hematology blood lab, which is why I was allowed to give this test to the What we're going to do, we're going to spend the entire day on the important thing. We're going to review all three chapters since the last exam. Now, if you remember, the very first topic that we uh, came on was infectious disease. And they asked me to make a few questions for that. And you might have known what my questions were. I'm assuming you know they were straightforward and things that we discussed and things I thought were important. We're going to make, uh, we're going to show you 50 slides today. And duh. Aren't there going to be 50 questions on the exam? Are you sure the question that will be for those slides? But we're not just going to show you the slides. I could say, there's a yellow one, there's a yellow one, know that, know that, know that. We're going to go over the points and discuss them. Because I sincerely believe, and I'm trying very hard not to use the F word again, but I sincerely believe these people that make up exams, these sadistic bastards. See, I didn't use the upward. <laughs> They've never practiced medicine in their life, and they run around with the delusion that by being sadistic to you, they're making you into good doctors. Well, you know that's total bullshit, don't you? Okay. And I have nothing but contempt for them. And uh, it's not the way I would do things. It's not the way I'm going to do things here. If they make me do things here like that, I'm not going to be here. It's as simple as that. We're going to be a, have a very positive attitude. We're going to make sure that you are really competent in these areas. And when it comes time, you know, I know you're going to review everything. But when it comes time and you're sitting on a chair like that, and you've got to take something called the step, you know, you're going to have a core knowledge to make those so-called integrated type decisions, okay? If somebody tells you that they have insight as to what's going to be on the exam, or if somebody ever uses the term to you, high yield, you know, the latest stupid buzzword of the century, they're liars, they're deceiving you. People like Kaplan have made millions or billions of dollars into taking fearful exam junkies like you all are and saying, well, look, we're going to make it easy for you. We know the answers, you know. Well, you know that doesn't work. And not that, Cap not that going through all the board questions isn't a good idea. I gave a course in board uh, review a few years ago. And we dissected each one like an autopsy. And we went to these different databases. Some of them were the ones you pay money for, and some of them were free. Probably the best one is the one that, uh, you know, the board, or what we call step one, USML, puts out themselves. I don't know if it's called USML, e world, but it's the one that's right on their website. And it's probably good to do a lot of practicing of stuff like that. But the core knowledge that you need for that is the thing that you're getting right here. So, I am not going to pretend like I know the answers, or better yet, I'm absolutely not going to pretend like I know the questions, because nobody knows the questions, and you know that. And I want to make sure that when you're in that stage, you're going to be prepared. Now, you're not really too bad. The past two people are totally freaked out, because they're much closer to it, and they have something called the shell, for example, and like, you can't even talk to them. You can't even say, hey, this is what a red cell looks like. They're going, oh, is that in Gold John's Rapid Review? You know, it just doesn't work that way. So what we're going to do, it, with the help of Van <coughs> over here, is we're going to go over the three chapters, flip through. There's about, what, 80, 90 slides per chapter. We're going to whip through them real fast. I know you've been through them. If there are PowerPoints on there that you've never seen before, let me tell you, you're in deep shit. You're in real deep shit. It doesn't matter whether you came to class or not. So, uh, Francesca, what I'm going to do is uh, see these three things here. We're going to start out with uh, the first one, which is child. And then we're going to go to immune. 
-hmm. then we're going to go to the third one, which is uh, hematology. The one we spent a lot of time on. And the reason why I'm asking you to do it is because this is one time that I wish to be close to the screen. And I remember that Dr. Rogers had a big stick here, but he must have taken it with him. Is there a big pointer stick around here somewhere? Does anybody have one of those long, retractable things in their pocket? No? Yeah, you got a couple. I'll take one. Well, let's see, I, I really have to be close to the uh, microphone. That's the problem. So how about if we do something like this? OK. Um, now, you want to make this in full screen mode or not? Let me think. Yeah, let's make it in full screen mode. Put that little thing there. This is how we started out to talk about leanings. We stand the bottom, it's like a, there you go. So we could see if this one, you know, that can't possibly be on the exam. Next one. This is just outline of the chapter. You know, that can't be it. It's a nice good thing to sort of remember, but don't remember for the exam. Next one. Statistics, it's not yellow, but I think you should generally know that still in this great nation of USA, African Americans are twice the rate of whites for uh, infant mortality. And if we think we're so great, there are a lot of places that are a lot better than we are, and a lot of places that are a lot worse. Next one. Uh, that's just kind of a definition. It's not yellow, is it? Keep going. Okay, that's sort of a definition to, uh, mm, I think that if you take both of those last two slides and remember that the closer you have to birth, the more likely you have to die. How's that sound? Next one. Uh, we're going to talk, did we talk about congenital anomalies? Did uh, somebody ask a question or say something? I, yeah, they didn't hear you. What's that? They did not hear what you were saying earlier. Oh, uh, the closer you are to birth, the closer a kid is to birth, the most likely he is to die of something. Except when he gets into the age group where, you know, homicides and suicides come in, which is like at the very, very end of what we call childhood. Let's say teenage years. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, next one. Okay, that's what you got to know. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do it now. A disruption uh, is a situation like an amniotic band. It's something that's already developed, but it's constrained you know, like by a rubber band, an amniotic band. A uh, deformation is something that is not fully developed because of biomechanical forces. They're related. You have to also know that what we used to call Potter's uh, syndrome is now called Potter's sequence, because in the sequence, one thing happens and then the sequelae are generally the features of the disease. So they both cause like two cases. Yeah, in one case it's developed and the other one has to be prevented from being developed. Okay. Just know that. I mean, I could just flash through all the other ones and say, no, it's cold. But I'm going to be emphasizing some of them. Now here, let me look at my example over here. Oh, I know I put that somewhere. It's probably over here. Okay, next one. Okay, some nice examples. You know, I can't possibly <coughs> put a picture on the exam. By the way, I could, and I looked at some of your old exams, and some of them have pictures, but I'm not really a picture exam kind of person. We draw in the text quick text questions. Dr. Gerard says, Well, you know, you have to make them print the audience and set up the case presentation. Well, I know a lot of people do that, but I don't believe in it. Okay, next one. Next one. That's yellow. So when you think of those major things like oligohydramnios, you know, compression, pulmonary hy hypoplasia, I think those are all logically followed with that. That yeah, there's not enough amniotic fluid baby being compressed. Very important question. Next one. There's a sequence, but it's not yellow. Next one. There's a nice uh, baby showing the classical features, but including things like uh, some of the placental findings and going. 
You gotta know these. And by the way, uh, they are all logical. I mean, not really logical, but there are things that you learned about the chapter one for the most part. If you remember that. I mean, I know you already took the path, but you still should remember something like that. Like, let's say I say something like, what do you call it when an organ increases in size, but the number of cells stays the same? What would you call that? Okay. Next one. Next one. Uh, we had a picture of the three most common ones. I think you should probably get a general feel what the top three are. And you know, even though a lot of those are, you might think are common. You know, like I told you, that bad itself is not that uncommon. But look, it's only about three percent compared to all those double digit ones. No, the double digit ones. Next one. Okay, there you go. There's a nice picture. It's not yellow, but you can have to know it for the test. Next one. Uh, what's the biggest uh, thing in that slide? What's the one with the biggest spot? So yeah, there's a lot of things. We call them the usual stuff, stuff that we do in the radiation viruses. But when it comes to so-called generally and general anomalies, most of them are unknown. I give you an example of uh, having to do autopsies and still forms and anomalies. Did somebody ask a question? I heard somebody say something, and really, I don't have my hearing aid today. Okay, next one. Uh, that's kind of nice. I think the general thing you want to take home from this is that most people think that anomalies might develop in middle or right pregnancy, but if you look at the next table, the critical period for development of most organs. Next one, Francesca, is really very, very early, you know, from three to eight weeks. Next one. <coughs> okay, we talked about some genetic causes. We talked about trisomies. Um, but I bet you you have that on your genetics chapter. Okay, next one. Okay, those are the two big ones. And what if I also say something like, well, what's the biggest one? Well, if we don't really have rubella anymore, then what's the biggest one? And isn't that also the C, the torch as well? Next one. Next one. No, well, those are some theoretical, <coughs> hopefully logical things why teratogens might work. Uh, I don't think we really should know them too well. It's nice to read, but you're not really on the You know, like, you know, probably in the or something like that. Next one. <coughs> Uh, macrosomal embryopathy, it's not yellow, I think. You know, what I'm trying to tell you is, um, you know, a lot of students think that everything they have to know for the staff should be on the PowerPoint. You know, I know you're not going to admit that, but I, I sense a lot of that over here, and let me tell you, that's a death wish at suicide. You know, I know all the professors will tell you, well, you've got to read this book, you've got to read that, you've got to read that. You know, then I almost have to tell you that as well as a legal disclaimer. I would love to think that all the points I cover are going to be on the set. But I'm telling you, uh, I, would, I would probably blow many, many, many questions on the set. Why? Because they're made up by pinheaded bastards. That's why. <laughs> they're not made up by logical people or real doctors. Okay, come on. Next one. Uh, you know the definition of preacher and poster. That'd be nice, but it's not yellow, is it? Next one. <laughs> you know SGA, LGA, it's a the statistical definition. Prematurity. Next one. Fetal growth restriction. Know how that's different. How, know what undergrow, how undergrown is different from immature. Next one. Uh, fetal growth. You should know what all the letters stand for in torch. Now go back. Uh, <coughs> like if someone said, what does the O stand for? You know, don't say that that's an oxidative phosphorylation. You know, it's probably the only one that doesn't make sense. All the others are bugs, but O means other because they always want to have a way out. Don't they? Next one. Placental FGR. 
Okay, that's my next one. Internal FGR. Next one. Organ immaturity. Next one. Okay, I think uh, you should know the FGR. I think you should know the highest possible score you can go to. What, two, four, six, eight, or ten? Because you can get up to two for maximum for each chapter, and AFGAR has five letters. And even though somebody made a nice little cap <coughs> in here, a parent's books <coughs> with an activation response, there really was a woman by the name of Virginia AFGAR. So it's almost like an insult to her to turn her name into an acronym. Or maybe it's an honor, I don't know. Next one. Uh, next one. Um, <coughs> I think you should know backwards and forwards, upside down, in your seat, standing up on hand with the main problem that's in the respiratory distress syndrome. You know that it's all in the all surfaced and usually due to immaturity. That's the number one thing. Get, get a tattoo. Next one. Yeah. Louder. Okay, I'll speak louder. Thank you. I'm speaking loud enough for them, but not for you. Okay. Um, know that surfactant, surfactant, surfactant. Next one. Okay, we know what the big risk factors are. Prematurity by far the biggest, but diabetes, C such, is not yellow. Next one. Am I okay now? Next one, uh, I think you could probably pick out uh, hyaline membranes there, because that's another name for it, but you know I'm not going to put that picture on the exam. Aren't you glad to learn it anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you say yeah, but everybody say hell no. Next one, okay, we talked about VQ mismatches. Hopefully this is just a little physiology review. You know what a VQ mismatch is, but not for the exam. You have to give a whole bunch of other examples of it somewhere along the line. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Okay, we discussed high drops. Uh, ad nauseum. I don't think I have to review that. I think we've touched upon it from a lot of different directions. We know it's basically IREX sensitization. Producing a gene of the severe response and all the symptoms. Right, Irene? Isn't that right? I know you know that. Next one. There's a nice baby. Next one. That's not next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Ah, you don't have to know that, but you should know what extra medullary hematopoiesis is, right? Is that the same as myeloid metaplasia? Certainly is. Next one. Connectorous. Hey, why is it yellow? Is a unconjugated or conjugated bilirubin most likely to stain fatty tissue like white matter in the brain? Right, because once it gets conjugated, it's more water soluble. That's why it's conjugated. Next one. Okay, we all know about that stuff. Next one. Okay, let's talk about the, the first two. I think you should know basically the genetics behind the first two. Next one. I think you should know what enzyme is missing and what happens if it is. I think you should know about the uh, brain damage. I think you should know about the mental retardation. I think you should know the fact that it's uh, it's elevated in the blood, obviously, because the enzyme can't convert it, but then it gets into the urine as well. Next one. If I tend to slip and go soft again, don't be afraid to just yell out again. Seriously. Okay, GALT, we all know what that stands for. Uh, we know that the lack of it causes galactosemia. And just like we knew the major clinical sequelae of PKU, you should also know the major clinical sequelae of gall uh, deficiency as well. Like fatty liver, fatty chain, cataracts, brain damage, next one. Cystic fibrosis, we spend a lot of time on it. 
okay? Uh, I'm thinking that even if I didn't say anything about it again, there's something that's stuck in there. Next one. Okay, you know basically it's a chloride problem, even though it secondarily involves uh, sodium. It's basically a genetic chloride problem. The end result is hyperviscous secretions in all of the glands and ducts that uh, uh, transport mucinous type material. So, no. <coughs> well, that's yellow. And uh, we had a lot of diagrams on it, but I think this one's probably the best because it shows the camp, and he said either the camp never comes to the surface of the blood <coughs> or it comes to the surface and it doesn't work. But either way, there's a chloride problem. Next one. Okay, next one. Next one. Next one. Pretty much the same stuff we talked about. Uh, next one. I think when you look at it, that's yellow because we're looking at a spectrum from very, very severe to very, very mild. So you know that's going to depend on the positivity of the sweat test and, of course, ultimately the phenotypic expression of the disease. And uh, probably, next one, uh, you know that the major organs involved are things like pancreas, liver, genitalia, sweat glands, but it's any cell that transport product. Those are the ones that are important because more transport that can be serious problems. And most people that die of cystic fibrosis die because of what organ? Is it gas nephrons? Is it sweat glands? Is it lung? Is it heart? It's lung, isn't it? Pseudomonas infection. Pseudomonas loves cystic fibrosis lungs. Next one. Next one, normal pancreas. Next one, look at, look at that top thing and really understand that. What's the most likely gram negative to infect the lung? Pseudomonas. Next one, there's a nice lung. Next one, uh, next one, next one. Next one, SIDS. We've got to say, we've got to, we've got to have something on SIDS. Uh, next one, no, the main thing you have to know that it's an exclusive, the diagnosis of exclusion, uh, so that whatever that word is in there that says remain at blah, 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 blah. Whichever the word in that NIH definition, unexplained is probably the big word. That means the diagnosis of exclusion. Next one. Okay, you know it's the leading cause of death, but that's not yellow, is it? Next one. So I'm just repeating it. I think you should generally, if I throw a bunch of risk factors out there, then you can all generally relate them to general things like parental factors, infant factors, environment. You know, like for example, you know, hyperthermia is a risk factor. Prone sleeping position, that was a risk factor, but probably the only one you could very easily control. That's why it's gone down in the United States. You know that basically drug abuse in parents is statistically related, maybe not causally related, but statistically related. You know, maybe a lawyer can make a case for a cause, but we are just talking about statistical relations, relationships here for the most part. Next one. Okay. Next one. Next one. Are we uh, stuck somehow? Oh no, next one. Next one. Tumors, we've got to say thing about tumors. I mean, we said a lot, we showed you a lot of pictures. We showed you a lot of morphologies. We talked about cells and rosettes and neuropil and stuff like that. I hope you sort of remember that. Next one. But really, I think the only thing we should just kind of uh, study. Next one, next one, next one, next one, next one, next one. Right there. I think you should have probably a really good feel for the kinds of malignancies that kids get. For example, why didn't we talk about leukemia? Why didn't we talk about lymphomas? Well, it's because adults get them too. So the only ones we really talked about were the ones that only ones that kids get. And you should sort of remember that the age group for neuroblastoma is usually a little bit younger 
where the age group overwhelms human. And I think you should even sort of remember that as you get into the teenage years, you're seeing a couple things there, like osteogenic sarcoma, which would not ever, you would never see in a, a younger age group than that. Next one. Okay, this is probably more for pathologists to know, and I don't really expect a regular medical student to uh, give a differential of a small blue cell tumor, small round blue cell tumor, which is what, what all the lymphomas look like, but so all, do most of these pediatric tumors look like small round blue cells like lymphomas. Some of them are lymphomas. Next one. Next one. Next one. Oh, I think, you know what, this is not on the exam, but I'll tell you that. So I jump up and down and say, big time board. Somebody's going to, along the line, someone here like, show you a damn picture of a road death. And you should have to look at a bunch of guys sitting around the table, you know, what they do in China. Next one. I was in China, and I'll tell you. My mother told me, when I was a kid, that if you don't eat everything on your plate, just think of those poor, starving children in China, okay? So here I am, uh, 50 or 60 years later, and I go to China, and guess what? They leave stuff on their plate, too. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Next one. Some of these principles, go back a second. Some of these principles I think are worth repeating. If a tumor looks like it's differentiating into whatever it should differentiate into, like ganglion or glomeruli, it's probably going to behave a lot better than a tumor that doesn't really look like it's differentiating into anything. Number one principle, but then what? You've already passed your exam on tumors, haven't you? Next one. Next one. Next one. Oh, uh, it's not yellow, but you know, if you were to give a talk uh, to encourage cancer people about all of the cancers that have had miraculous improvements in therapy in the last 10, 20, 30 years. This is one of the very close to copy of this. The mortality for wounds is basically, you know, we basically cut that thing to help. Most of them survive now, even if they're spread at the time of diagnosis. Next one. Next one. Well, I don't think you should have to know about blastema, epithelial, and so on. It's kind of like a pathologist thing. Next one. I don't even think they'll show you that. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Okay, we're done. Good. Take a deep breath. <coughs> we're one-third done. Which means we'll definitely finish within two hours. And, you know, I, at first I started following my actual exam questions here, but they didn't quite... Uh, conform to the exact sequence that we were discussing with. It. But let me just go over these real quickly again. What's wrong over here? Why is this not showing well? Okay. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> were you running too fast? <laughs> Who's the one that ran up for this? It's your fault. You're running so fast, you've knocked off most of the pages. Oh, no, here they are. Hold on, let me take a look. Let me see if there's something, I, if there's a question here I didn't jump up and down to when we just reviewed them all. Oh, they're so easy. So Dr. Minaj, if we focus on the yellow slide and like a little bit of information you said on the other blue, you should be fine? You don't ace my exam, you get 100%. I hope so. You miss one, you're in deep, so. deep, deep. Okay. For example, remember how you jumped up and down and I said, osteogenic sarcoma is only in the teenagers. Remember that? Yeah. Well, that's not something you can get by just downloading the damn thing from the M drive, is it? <laughs> Remember how I said pseudomonas five or six times in the last 20 minutes? You know how I said chloride? You know how I said, uh, what's the definition of a sequence? <coughs> I did with the after 
Okay, you you just aced the first part of my exam. Take a deep breath. Okay. Okay. I, uh, when I taught at uh, Chicago Medical School, I really, really wanted the students to contribute in the exam. And I know some professors do this. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm probably going to have 50 people here today rather than 10. So I'll just let everybody look at a yellow slide and design a question that they think would be the type of multiple choice question whereby it would not only be a question, but when they're done doing the question, if they didn't learn it before the exam, they're going to learn it from the question. So when you take my exam and you look at those 50 questions, ask yourself, are these just little sadistic questions or are they designed in such a way that I'm learning and reinforcing what I already know or should know? That's how exams should be. Well, anyway, so I asked a guy that was called the president of the class. I'll never forget his name, but I can't remember it. <laughs> it's a mental block. I'll probably remember it in my sleep. I said, uh, Brad, could you help me do these uh, questions? And I said, don't worry. I said, you're not violating anything. You know, they hit, these students have a very weird idea about ethics. You know, you know, they learn that they shouldn't. You know. Uh, or look at somebody else's paper in class or gonna be a bad doctor at the same time, you know, they fuck their associates out of their pension plans. So, you know, there's there's a strange uh, concept of ethics going around in medicine. So uh, the next day I get called by the dean and he goes, John, come on into my office. And he's there and another dean is there and he slams the door. And I go, uh oh. And this is the last time uh, this happened to me, I was fired. <laughs> he, he really says, well, look, I got this email from Brad. And he says that you are going to show him the answers on the test. I says, yeah, I wanted to help him, uh, you know, tell me what he thinks is pertinent. He's a smart kid. And, you know, I don't really care anyway. Well, anyway, I got in deep trouble for it. And I said, well, if you don't like it, fire me. And they didn't fire me. So I'm not going to be busted uh, this time either. Are you ready to go to the second chapter? Yeah. Or you want to take a break? Okay, listen to the second chapter, then we'll take a break, okay? So you can tell, not only do I have contempt for the step, I have a contempt for all tests. I don't know about you, but I know two students that kill themselves because of exams. Out of windows, okay? And they're very, very very injurious to your mental health. They turn you into junkies. They make you into compulsive things. You, you're climbing around like those maggots in the picture. Or, you know, exams should be banned. There should be better ways. If, you know, like I said, if you spent your entire life savings and then some to experience the joy <coughs> of learning that, then let's bring it back to damn joy. Okay, you want to do the next chapter? Uh, uh, let's try it this time with the uh, not the full screen, just so they know what's coming up and what I know is coming up. That's just the title page. Next one. Am I talking loud enough? Uh, we talked about objectives. You know, I think those might have been yellow at some point in time, but you know, that's generalities. Next one. I'm assuming there's going to be yellow stuff there coming up. Next one. Next one. Next one. Well, here we go. Next one. I think you should have a really good idea of the nature of the movie. Totally solid. You know, but somebody said the big picture. Thank you for introducing the word. I'm going to remember that the rest of my life. Uh, and all of the features of a native immunity versus its opposite acquired immunity. And what do we call the other one? Acquired or we call it something else? Adaptive. Same as acquired. And know that one depends on previous sensitization, things like antibodies, has to be a result of previous exposure. It's a more uh, a learning type of process as opposed to the things that we just have as part of our base of armamentarium. You know, if you're all soldiers and you're going into battle, well, you know, you have your uh, helmets, you have your uniforms, you have your boots, you know, that's your innate immunity. But then your adaptive immunity is like 
what you know from experience, how you know the enemy, how you can fight it. So which one is more important? I don't know, they're both pretty damn important, but I'd rather know my enemy than have the proper boot size on it, I'll tell you. Next one. Uh, know that that's the most logical possible classification. It's endured uh, even longer than I have as your basic division for adaptive immunity. One cells, one's antibodies. This <coughs> one. Next one. <coughs> I think we went through this general scheme here. Um, here we go. Next one. Next one. Those are nice pictures, and they're sort of nice to remember now. You've seen a million of them in the layout, but there's no reason to put that on your hand. Next one. Next one. And you know that's a macrophage. You know they're energy presenting. You know they have a lot of surface area because they are energy presenters. Next one. You know macrophages are the only general cells in your body that shoot things up. So you see any almost any cell that's pretty granular with a few exceptions probably going to be a macrophage. Next one. Can I ask you just a general question about that? Yeah. When a macrophage takes in a microorganism, it destroys it and then presents a piece of it, right? And no. No. Okay. Remember, when you're at the general scheme of things, the, the macrophage is generally uh, results in the initial recognition of it. And then it sends signals. It presents it to the T cell. And then the T cell may secrete cytokines or may activate uh, the other types of T cells, which will eventually then start working on the cell. And finally, as a uh, end result to both cellular and humoral immunity, well, then they have the so-called phagocytosis. So I just have a question about that. Um, if it doesn't destroy it, how does it present like a transit to the chain? If originally it doesn't destroy it, originally it just recognizes it. Okay. And then it sends that signal to the smart uh, CD4 cell. Next one. Uh, next one. Next one. What if I said something like, next one, next one. Next one. What if I said something like, what kind of cells secrete cytokines? Really, uh, basically, when you look at your whole list of cytokines, maybe you learn about it in you know, cell biology, or histology, or physiology, or immunology, or the chapter on acute inflammation. There's so many different types of cytokines 